creative time to uh, join us in this conversation. We are meeting as uh, women from the region to share our experiences uh, on the work we've been doing in regard to Resolution 1325, uh, but also to meet with each other and just celebrate. 20 years after the passing of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security, we are calling on the recognition of gendered experiences of women and girls in war, peace, reconstruction and action for change. Women's work to reduce, eliminate violence, resolve and uh, transform conflict, care, ensure security and build peace is significant to our everyday lives and humanity. The local women's voices for peace virtual conference brings together people from around the globe to reflect on this moment. At the regional level, we, the Eastern African Women Human Rights Defenders, are gathered here today to share our work, the challenges we've been facing, and the lessons that we have been able to learn so far. To help us in this conversation, I have my co-moderator, who is Asha. Before I get to introduce Asha, I want just to read a few house rules. One of them is about muting our microphone. We will request that if you're not speaking, kindly switch off your microphone. We will be making use of our chat boxes to um, raise any issues we might have in regard to questions, clarifications, but also to appreciate the sharing that women will have shared because the experiences are diverse. We will equally summarize towards the end uh, all the issues that will have come out and request that if you have recommendations that you would want to make for women human rights defenders for resolution 1325 looking at our region the chat box will be an uh, a platform that you can use i want to appreciate all the attendees we want to see you sharing also your experiences because it is not just about women the men in the house are men who have given us give, who have been giving us support and we want to ask that you also support us throughout the session moving straight on to introduce my co-moderator mwanga mastula asha is from uganda she is a phd fellow of human rights at makerere university she holds two bachelor degrees, a bachelor in development studies and a bachelor in law. She also has a master's degree on human rights, all from Makerere University. Mwanga is an international human rights scholar, activist and lawyer who tries to talk, write, live, work and love the feminist way. She has specialization in access to justice and women's hum international human rights. She is a recognized spokesperson and an expert in the way law impacts on marginalized people's lives and, and in women's rights and violence against women. Ms. Mwanga has over 12 years experience working in municipal, regional, national, international, multicultural, urban, and remote context. Her area of interest includes human rights, peace and security, gender studies, sexuality, feminist legal theory, and storytelling. Mwanga, I'm happy to be moderating this session with you, and I want to invite you so that you can lead us in the first session. I can see uh, Havin has already joined us, and I'm hoping that Jane Francis from Uganda will equally join us. So for everybody, help me to welcome Asha into moderating this session. Thank you, Salome. Thank you very much uh, for, for that wonderful introduction. 
I will not go so much again into introducing myself, but to just let you know that I'm joining you from Kampala, Uganda. Uh, just a quick reminder to all of us that uh, this conference is basically targeting how women are making UN Security Council Resolution 1325 Rio. And this being a regional session, we are majorly looking at stories from East Africa and basically stories from the community leaders. We have a number of panelists that are joining us today who are going to be sharing with us their visibility and all their invisibility in East Africa. And uh, they'll also be sharing with us their, the challenges, if, if any, or any uh, lessons and or key experiences and uh, at, the regional, at the regional level. They will also highlight to us the work of women human rights defenders and or at, uh, uh, at, as CSO members or advocates in localizing UN Security Council Resolution 1325 for the rights and well-being of women, communities and all families at the regional level. Going straight into our first session, I will introduce to you our first panelist, who is Miss Elliot Orizara from Uganda. Uh, a brief bio of Miss Elliot Orizara. She is the founder and executive director of Women and Girl Child Development Association, WICSIDA here in Uganda. And she has been a board member of the National Association of Women Organizations in Uganda. She is also the vice chairperson of Civil Society Budget Advocacy Group, CSBAG, also here in Uganda. She is a founder and partner with the African Gender and Equity Hub. She has a wider experience and expertise in gender and development with a passion for social economic empowerment of women and girls. Since 1999, Ms. Elliot has worked and on women and girls development and policy analysis uh, with a stronger experience of inputting the, the gender perspective. Please join me in welcoming Miss Elliot Orizara. And straight away to Miss Elliot Orizara, please share with us, like I have already alluded to, your experience or your key lessons and or any challenges in localizing the UN Security Council Resolution 1325. Please welcome. Yeah, thank you so much, Asha, for the introduction. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, listeners. Thank you for joining the discussion. Uh, once again, my name is um, Elliot Olizara Tumujuche. Asha has already mentioned that I work for Women and Girl Child Development Association. And uh, I want to go direct to what Asha has uh, asked about the experience of localizing women's voices uh, in the 1325 resolution. Uh, my, my story starts in 1999, even when I had not known what it means by peace and development, but engaging in different uh, areas and different cycles where women and girl children have been key to the issues of development. I will first of all share, especially in terms of what we have as pillars of 1325 resolutions. And I will first of all talk about the issue of participation from different regions of Uganda, where we have four regions, we have different norms and cultures, and where majority of women and girls have not been able to participate effectively because of the gender norms and the beliefs. At our household level, this building, majority, uh, most of the issues have been discussed and therefore the issue of decision making has not been an issue for women, but an issue for men. And as we celebrate the, uh, the 1325 resolution, 
20 years is a journey that in Uganda, we may think that a girl who is 18 years and above, according to the Ugandan rules, is a person who is supposed to sit on the table, share experience and think through the issues of peace building. But I must uh, admit that for the Ugandan case, we have not had the majority of women, the majority of girls participating effectively in issues of peace building. And therefore, this has affected development of different girls and women in different regions of the country. I will again share experience through uh, the second pillar of protection. We have had cases in the Uganda women's movement where we have been seeing women and girls coming out to protect themselves. And then the government policies in place also signing into the legal and the laws that protect girls and women. But uh, still through the local, uh, the local perspective, we have seen again a lot happening. And most especially if we consider today where we have had the pandemic. We have had experience where girls and women have been affected and mainly by issues of gender-based violence. And it has been a very critical issue where the majority of women's rights organizations have come out to ensure again the issue of reporting becomes a very big problem and this has been a problem because again of the first areas that i mentioned the issue of our cultures the issue of patriarchal tendencies of if a woman has been battered then it is okay it is maybe uh, it is love we are beating that she has been beaten because of love so there is no need for reporting the case maybe to the, lab, the local councils or to the police. And uh, my own experience again shows that we need to work towards protection that the local communities and mainly in the local areas, in the, what we call villages in Uganda, and mainly in the slum areas where, first of all, the, the person who is supposed to protect the woman, the person who is supposed to protect the girl, is may be not aware of what he is because he has also come from violence. The issue of violence against you to be just ended at home. No need of taking it to the to the legal, the legal places. I will like to speak through the experience of, um, of the prevention measures. And I must uh, admit that, yes, in Uganda, where we have different women's rights organization working in local areas, and um, looking at who is uh, supposed to improve the interventions, the women's rights organization in Uganda and individuals have really tried to do this. But again, it goes back to the issue of patriarchy, the issue of culture in different regions in Uganda. And this has really affected uh, the development of, of women and girls. I will again shortly talk about the issue of relief and recovery. And I want to take this in terms of uh, environmental violence, of which uh, most development specialists have really worked on issues of relief and recovery, but for the sake of women and girls who are the most affected persons during maybe uh, floods, most especially in, in Uganda and in our local uh, regions, it is some that uh, 
uh, their tribe is one of the regions uh, rockers that really affects the, the, the farmers and different communities. But again, this has not been well managed and most especially uh, the policy makers have a tendency of thinking that everyone is affected during any pandemic. But for the issue of relief, we have not really uh, gone beyond to think through and strategize of how many women and girls have been affected in such a uh, pandemic. I, I don't know how much time I have, Asha, but I really wanted to talk about uh, experience uh, on gender-based violence and working hand in hand with uh, coalition, uh, coalition Action for 1325 Co-Act, where mainly our organization has engaged with uh, uh, communities in Wakiso and mainly in uh, Nansana and, and Ganda, where most especially if you have had cases of girls and women being killed, and this uh, happened mainly in, in Nansana municipality. And this also was something, is something that we may need to discuss in this meeting where, but we have never had in person coming back. This woman, because of this, all that have tried to follow up with the local councillor and the local community police for police stations, they just uh, came out to say no. It's because these women had just come out of their houses to go out to to uh, to, to have their sex work, but again, they are killed because they have not fulfilled, and this has really left us in questioning why such a cases happen and then the government does not come out to, to, to protect and the government does not come out to give the right information. I think this goes back to what challenges do uh, defenders face and most especially us who really talk for issues of uh, of women and girls being violated, children being violated. But again, <laughs> this takes, takes us to be different from the community members. Looking at you as a defender becomes a problem. And if you are trying to bring out issues of peace building and mainly on the issue of the women killings in, in, in our local areas becomes a problem. I would want again to share on the issue of lack of data and confirmation. Elliot, you have around three minutes. You have around three minutes to end your presentation. Thank you. Okay, I, I want to talk about the issue of data collection. And uh, this has really affected the defenders because there is no way you take, you take a case to police or you take a case to the local councillor or to the, higher, uh, to the higher legal spaces when you don't have enough data. And this goes to the recent data that has been collected on the women that have been battered, on the girls that have been defiled and the cases of gender-based of, of gender violence that have been uh, reported. But again, different people bringing different data, which are not, first of all, uh, have a knowledge and, and, uh, an author, and then it becomes very difficult. I would want to uh, end my sharing by suggesting some of, uh, of the recommendations. First of all, um, I would want to suggest that having, work, having worked on issues of gender-based violence and having worked with the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development without having enough resources to follow up such cases, to have data that we can share that can help us confirm and affirm that this has happened in the community, it still becomes a problem. 
And therefore, I really want to call upon uh, you, uh, sisters and brothers, that we must ensure that gender-based violence is integrated in our plans and budgeting. And then we must make sure that we build strong movement of young girls to be able to, to, to join the movement to understand why peace and development is very important. And as we celebrate, I know we have a very big challenge where boys and men are saying it is not very important for us to have a movement of girls without boys. But I think the issue of engaging boys at the right time is, so, is something that I would want to recommend. And Asha, if I still have another minute. Hello, Asha. Yes, 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 you can conclude, Elliot. Yeah, I want to conclude that uh, for me and the organization that I work with and the movement that I, I, I belong, the movement of women and girl children, I want to recommend that the government should not only think of preventing without giving us a strong commitment since they understand that they have signed to most of the international instruments and then fail to give us the report that can help us continue, uh, the, uh, continue the movement and try to bring out the, the, the issues that we were and as a resolution. 20 years is a journey that we may need again to strategize and see how we can cross the gaps. Thank you so much for listening and I will be waiting for the questions and contributions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Elliot. You see, when you were speaking, you were ideally speaking to my heart because most of the issues that you raise here, I have actually witnessed many of them. You mentioned the killing of women in Wakiso district. For our sisters and brothers who are joining us from other parts of the world, Wakiso is one of the districts here in Uganda. And uh, I think last year and the other year, we had a number of women and girls being killed. You know, like being killed erroneously, you know, um, you would wake up one morning and you hear that woman A has been killed in such and such a place within the within the, the district. And up to date, we have never got any report. So when you raise this, I really uh, hear you. Uh, Elliot also raised um, a number of other issues uh, and uh, she highlighted them as some of the pillars of uh, the UN Security Resolution 1325. And she brings in a pertinent issue of participation to which she said that uh, there are a number of women for the case of Uganda, girls and women who are not participating in, uh, in peace, in development and in their own enjoyment and or implementation of their rights. And one of the factors that she raised, she raised was the issue of patriarchy and or norms, which, which for me, when, when she raises patriarchy, like you and I already know that patriarchy is a very pertinent issue to which most of our communities think that a woman or a girl cannot speak, a girl or a woman cannot participate in the decision making of, um, uh, of, of their own development as, as well. She also raises the issue of protection to which she says that there are so many cases of women and girls who are not protected. And she also raised the issue of the pandemic, which has affected many of, uh, many of us. For the case of, U of Uganda, we have seen uh, cases of gender-based violence going high. And one of the reasons is because women are staying longer with their perpetrators. Because before the pandemic, at least they would go out to work here and there. But as of now, they have to stay longer for longer hours with their women, with their husbands. And I use the word quotes because an ideal husband would not torture um, their spouses. Uh, in conclusion, she made a number of uh, recommendations, but because of time, I will not go into all of them. I think I'll just uh, highlight one, the last recommendation that she made, 
which she says that she calls on government to come up and you know make commitments to us as the beneficiaries as the beneficiaries of these of these of these rights or the benefit or the victims of uh, uh, of issues like gender based violence Elliot says that uh, countries like Uganda have ratified a number of international instruments, but the implementation is a completely different thing. At this point, allow me hand over to Salome to bring on board our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Asha. Thank you, Elliot, for your sharing. Uh, quite a horrible situation. Uh, but now let's move on to get to hear our sister, Eden Hailu. Eden, ha Eden Fasiha Hailu is an assistant professor of law at Bahir Dar University in Ethiopia. She has been teaching and conducting research on women's rights for a long time. She's also a human rights defender. She is a board member of Ethiopian Human Rights Defenders Coalition and the program's director of the Association for Human Rights in Ethiopia. Welcome, Eden, and share with us your experience in Ethiopia. Okay, thank you very much, Salome, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. And I'm going to present the Ethiopian context in localizing and contextualizing this uh, 1325. And our country has been you know, under reform for the past two years. And in these two years, the government has shown a profound improvement in gender parity, particularly in uh, the high level um, decision making positions. And the Prime Minister, our new Prime Minister, Abiy Ahmed, appointed a number of female ministers in his cabinet. And in addition, for the first time in our modern history, we have got our first female president and the chief of justice. And I think the government has tried to uh, put women in places where they can play uh, their role in peace in the peace building process besides this as part of the political reform that our country has been going through the government has established this peace minister with the aim of preventing and resolving conflicts and building peace in the country and this uh, minister is also headed by a woman. In addition, just uh, as part of this reform, uh, the government has also established uh, a national uh, reconciliation um, commission with the aim of building peace. And the vice person of this commission is also a woman. And there are also many women working in the peace minister and in this uh, commission, which can play securing peace and security in the country, with, uh, the role of playing peace and security in the country. Nevertheless, this, despite this whole thing, um, ever since this political change has started in the country, there have been many communal conflicts and civil unrest in different parts of the country, in which hundreds lost their lives and millions were displaced. And women continued to suffer disproportionately during and after the unrest and conflicts occurring in the country. And they were brutally killed, uh, for instance, um, at some part of the country, uh, the women were murdered with their breasts cut off and in any other inhuman and brutal ways. And in addition, the reports of the International Organization for Migrants revealed that women and girls constitute more than half of the displaced people. So despite the fact uh, that, despite the establishment of this peace minister and the national reconciliation commission and the bringing women to the front to the higher level uh, decision-making positions, women are still suffering a lot. 
and these uh, conflicts and unrest, they are, they are being victimized, they are being targeted. And in addition to this, last year, in 2019, around 17 female university students were abducted uh, by gunmen in Oromia region, getting back home from their university, which is located in Oromia region. And it has been around 10 months since it happened, I think. And ever since uh, their whereabouts is not known yet and the, the government cannot rescue them. So it is very devastating and women are being victimized and being targets during conflicts and unrest and, the, and they are not being rescued even if the government has been trying to uh, show that it is bringing more women to the crucial decision-making positions, I think they are not acting accordingly and uh, women are still dying and they are, um, even they, they, many women have been raped during the unrest and these uh, communal conflicts. And this is really, sad. And when we come to the role of CESOS and uh, women human rights defenders in contextualizing and localizing this resolution, we may say that so far it is unsatisfactory, but this is mainly because uh, almost uh, for a decade the human rights civil society organizations and human rights defenders were made out of the game by the repressive law enacted in 2009 in our country. This law categorized civil society organizations getting more than 10% of their budget from foreign sources as foreign CSOs and prohibited them from engaging in human rights activities, including women's rights. But uh, currently this law is repealed and replaced by a democratic legal framework, which creates an enabling environment for civil society organizations and human rights defenders to work on human rights, including women's rights. But I think um, even after uh, uh, this uh, legal restriction is lifted up, uh, this human rights CSOs and human rights defenders are still in trauma and they are struggling to uh, start over and they, they are not, uh, I think because of this, they are not uh, living expectations. And our organization has been trying a lot and uh, it was established in and registered in uh, Geneva and it was it based there. It was established in 2015 to um, fill the gap that was created due to this repressive law, uh, the gap of uh, human rights civil society organizations in Ethiopia. And currently it is processing its registration here in Ethiopia, of course. And we have done a lot. We were following up this, uh, the kidnap in the kidnap, the case of kidnapped female university students, and we were urging the government to announce their whereabouts and also their uh, them. And we were also uh, enacting, I mean, issuing um, press releases uh, on various human rights violations that has been occurring uh, in different times in the country. And I call upon civil society organizations and human rights defenders to get stronger and come together and uh, go against the streets, against women that is happening almost everywhere in the country. In addition to this um, gender-based violences, which is really common here, uh, as we are having this patriarchal community, patriarchal society, women are also suffering uh, from this uh, communal uh, conflicts and unrest. And thank you very much for listening.
Thank you very much, Aiden, for sharing and uh, for what you're doing as a coalition. Just to bring out a few things, uh, Aiden has shared with us what the government has been able to do in terms of reform. We have a number of women uh, elected in various positions. Uh, at least they have a, C a female CJ. They have uh, a peace minister who is, uh, uh, who is a woman. And they also have a commission whose vice president is a woman. She goes ahead to identify the challenges uh, that they have been facing as a country, but also as women human rights defenders. Among them, conflicts that relate to land, uh, brutality and killings of women and girls. And uh, she also indicated that among the displaced, the highest number is women. Uh, together with you and the work the coalition is doing, in terms of the solidarity you have sought, I want to believe the women in this forum we have had. Aiden has reached out. We show solidarity with them. We speak against violations. And as they try to follow up on the kidnapping of the female university students, I think this is an area that we all can speak to and support the work they are doing. We have had, they have a, a repealed law that now gives them a little bit of space, but because of trauma, they are still trying to catch up. So ladies and gentlemen in this uh, meeting, uh, let's listen out, let's reach out to support the coalition in Ethiopia as they try to do their work. Uh, Asha, kindly come back to call in our next speaker. Okay, thank you, Salome, and thank you, Eden, for sharing your, your experiences. It seems the issue of patriarchy is it's all over. Uh, and uh, just like Elliot was sharing, the same issue of GBV kept coming up. I uh, will call in our next speaker, and uh, she is Ruth Mumbi. Ruth is uh, a community organizer and a social justice activist who has been involved in advocacy and litigation centering around class and economic oppression within her community in low-income neighborhoods in Kenya. With a rich track record in defending vulnerable women and youth dating back to over a decade, Ms. Mumbi is the founder of Bunge La Wamama Mashinani, a grassroots movement, which is amplifying the voices of grassroots women. She has been a leading voice in the discourses on the oppression of marginalized groups living in low-income low areas on conflict, sexuality, gender, reproductive health, sexual and gender-based violence. Please welcome me in, in uh, join me in welcoming Ruth Mumbi as she shares her experiences in the commemoration of the 20th anniversary of the UN Security Council Resolution 1325. Welcome, Ruth. Ruth, are you there? Salome, is she online? She is online, Ruth and mute, but I'm also trying to call yeah, her. She's, okay. she's, yeah. no, she's, I've been sorry. able to mute myself. Sorry for that. And okay. uh, uh, thank you so much for having me here. And it's such a, a privilege to reconnect with you, Mastula. This is the second time I'm reconnecting you, uh, with you. Uh, mm -hmm. At least I met you, I think it was last year, last year, but one at a Frida, oh, uh, Frida, the Frida conference here in, the, in Machakos. And thank you. So um, I'm, 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 thank I'm you. humbled. Thank you. I'm humbled to be part of this uh, wonderful uh, and uh, powerful uh, um, conversation with the women who are making differences, difference and impact across uh, East Africa. And uh, um, I just want to go straight to uh, what I have, uh, I have uh, to, uh, to speak about. I was requested to, uh, to largely uh, uh, talk about my experience that I have had recently with um, with the community that that I was defending during the pandemic, 
but before I go that, I just want to give a brief background of uh, where I'm coming from as a, an activist, as a human rights organization, a, a, a human rights organizer in, uh, in, 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 the, in the low income uh, area. I started organizing and I was inspired uh, to be uh, to, uh, to be to come into activism in 2008 2009 after the post election crisis which thrust me into the world of activism as part of the new generation of activists who emerge to restructure society at the local level uh, we uh, we realized that kenyan's problem largely arise from the crisis of patriarchy and uh, this is we are all in agreement as uh, uh, east africans that uh, patriarchy has been uh, the key uh, uh, the key challenge in our organizing in, um, in the challenges that uh, we continue to face as uh, women and also we also realized that predatory economics and the logic of patron client of the state where the allies are given a free hand in predatory extract extractivism among the marginalized such as where I work. In essence, my work is about the struggles of women in, um, in margins of the city life and the, act, and the quest to access the spatial center of the city life socially, politically, economically, despite the gender insensitive nature of the city of Nairobi, which is patriarchal from its origin. Uh, with such a, a colonial background, our struggles majorly, our struggle uh, uh, majorly, uh, uh, our struggle is majorly to amplify uh, the rights and the voice and the presence of women, uh, so that we can be able to liberate to, to liberate ourselves. Uh, since uh, 2008, I've been uh, I've been so much uh, doing a lot of advocacy from constitutional making uh, to, uh, of the current constitution where, uh, uh, whereby, uh, whereby it has been counted as one of the uh, most progressive constitution in, uh, in, in, uh, in the world. I led a group of uh, young women by then in 2010 uh, to, so for them uh, to understand the increased right in the constitution so that they can vote in for the constitution because we thought if we had uh, 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 we, if we had those rights, it would be easier to hold even the government accountable. I've also led uh, women uh, within the informal settlement to, uh, and especially domestic workers, to demand for their rights. I've also been active in extrajudicial killing. But today, I majorly want to focus, to focus on uh, the evictions that happened in Karyobangi which is an estate that was bequeathed uh, to, to, a, to retired employees of the city council of Nairobi. Uh, these evictions happened uh, during this, uh, the pandemic. It was on, on 4th of May. Uh, this is a community where uh, largely it was owned by women who were retired uh, female employees of the Nairobi city council, the, uh, which is the predecessor of the current uh, city county. These women were farmers and they requested for the idle land from the city council in order for them to get a piece of land, not only to build their abodes, but also, uh, as well, uh, but also get a source of livelihood through farming and renting. The retired employees of the city council of Nairobi requested and they were given the mother title by the city council of Nairobi. I think it was around uh, the year 2006, they, they, they later approached the, uh, the council again for them to give them full ownership. And the council agreed and they were given full ownership and later individually, everyone was given a title, an individual title. It is uh, uh, so, it is, uh, uh, as I had said, uh, this is a this is a, a community where majority of these people of the people who are living there who are old women and widows, and uh, in major, and majorly they will rent out the house so that they can uh, also have something uh, to, uh, to uh, something to eat. 
um, so when the evictions, uh, evictions came, uh, the eviction uh, happened. Uh, uh, they were given like they were given 24-hour hour. Um, what do you call it? They were given a 24-hour notification, which was in, in fact verbal for them to evict uh, in a land they had occupied for over for over two decades. And uh, they were able, and, and, and after they were given that uh, verbal uh, notice, they were able to run uh, to rush in court, and the court uh, gave out a. Uh, a court order for them not to be evicted, but the government went ahead to evict uh, these these people, these women. So uh, they were evicted, and I remember during the evictions, it was an it was a, a very rainy day, and uh, uh, people were not prepared. Some had even gone to work. Some had even uh, were outside of Nairobi because uh, the eviction came uh, when we were in a. Um, in a, in, a, in, a, in a mini uh, lockdown, because no one could uh, access Nairobi at that time, because people were told to, uh, to stay where they were. So uh, they were not traveling in and out of Nairobi. So a lot of people had gone to, to, their, to their rural home, because they were also fearing uh, uh, the pandemic. People were, uh, uh, were, say, were thinking because of the high population uh, in Nairobi, it made people vulnerable. So people were running out of Nairobi to go to a safer and a secure, se secure place. So many, when the eviction had happened, many had already gone to their, to their, to, to their rural home. So what, evic what this eviction did, it, uh, it, it, um, it denied and also it took away the social fabric of this community because these people had lived like uh, one community for over a decade. They were one family, they were used to each other. This is what was also not only a place they would call home, but everything, all their life was uh, in, this, in, in this community. Um, it affected majorly uh, women who were domestic workers, because uh, by the time the evictions were happening, there were a group of domestic worker who used, workers who used to live in this place, and majorly they were relying on the informal work where they would go to the neighboring uh, estates to, to, uh, to wash clothes, do domestic cares so that they can also, uh, they can also be, uh, be paid. And they majorly, one of the, one of the largest uh, estates that they were relying uh, to get uh, work is a place called Isli. And Isli was also in, in a total lockdown. So when uh, these evictions happened, and it was on 4th of uh, May, and at this time, some majority of people had already paid rent. And these people are people who usually live from hand to mouth. So they will not, uh, so what it meant, no one had even a single cent to go and rent out another place, because people, you know, people live from hand to mouth. So as a community organizers, human rights defenders, so we came up, we came together because uh, by then even the government had already censored mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the media not to report anything about this eviction that had affected over 5,000 people. So what we did, and, and, uh, and I must acknowledge the role that uh, uh, women, uh, human rights defenders play, in amplifying the struggles of their com of their communities, we called as community organizers. We called one um, activist who has a, a very good uh, a very good uh, following. He has massive following on Twitter to come in the in, in that community. And uh, when these uh, human rights uh, human rights activists uh, tweeted and went live on Twitter and said what was happening in this community. That was now the time that uh, the media started uh, showing the real stories that, uh, the stories that were coming from Kariobangi. So m myself and other human rights uh, uh, defenders uh, and majorly women, our role, we, we, we saw 
some out, uh, outrageous human rights violations where we were even seeing bulldozers. Uh, I remember there is a case in point where a young man was, uh, was, was injured by the bulldozer and he later lost his leg uh, as he was trying to secure his, his belongings. We also saw pregnant women and elderly women being uh, harassed and also being physically assaulted by, uh, by the police because there was a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, police who, were, who, who had been sent by the government to make sure that uh, the evictions uh, happened. So majority of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the mothers, and especially pregnant mothers, I remember as a, as, as a human rights activist and human rights defenders who we were collectively, collectively working together, we were forced now to, start, uh, to, uh, to be like, um, uh, to fill the gap. We started now collecting these stories, sharing uh, the stories on our, on, on our individual Facebook accounts, uh, Twitter, amplifying what was happening on the ground and Kenyans and, inf uh, and also international uh, um, uh, friends uh, who are living in abroad started, uh, ask started asking what uh, they can do to help. W when we were doing that, uh, we didn't have in mind that uh, we, we, we might be forced to do humanitarian work. But it's an idea that uh, came when we started sharing these stories and people started recommending, share these stories, but also tell us what we can do. So uh, we, 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 did, we started, uh, we start now after the, uh, people requesting Excuse to me. tell us what they can do. Excuse Hello, me, can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear Hello. you so loud. You're very loud and clear. Only to let you, to remind you that you have around three minutes to conclude your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Ms. Tula. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm almost uh, finished. But um, mm -hmm. one thing that uh, we have, uh, uh, one, uh, let me just uh, finish by saying, or rather, uh, let me just conclude uh, 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 by saying that uh, human rights activists did a lot of work. They, 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 we were able to uh, bail out women. We were able to bail out vulnerable people who were, in, uh, who, who were affected by the evictions. But later on, we did research who were the financiers of the project that was supposed to be, take, uh, to be, to be run in Kariobangi. And uh, we, uh, we knew, uh, we, after the research, we came to find it, uh, this project was funded by African Development Bank and, our, and, our, and, and, our, and the Kenyan uh, government. And uh, African Development Bank are funding this project uh, partially. So we wrote to them to bring into their attention and they acknowledge that they are the ones who are funding. So for me, what I will write, I will request um, uh, uh, other sisters across East Africa because uh, we have been uh, criminalized. We have been, uh, uh, we have been uh, threatened that uh, we, we, we will be disappeared if we continue to talk about uh, uh, Karobangi evictions. And we have also been warned to, to, to stop talking about or, or doing advocacy around the Karobangi evictions. But I, I believe in power of solidarity. And I also believe that uh, people, uh, when we stand together and uh, we, we start holding these uh, corporations accountable, our voice also matters. And I know corporate don't like to be ashamed. If you, uh, if our sisters across East Africa, if individually or collectively, we can uh, write to African Development Bank and tell them that uh, we know that you are doing this and this, or do a message of solidarity to stand in solidarity with Garyobangi women, we will really appreciate because our, our voices matter, and through that we can able to, uh, to fight uh, corporate uh, corruption and corporate irresponsibilities that, because uh, I know this is, this is something that has been going across East Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you so much for the wonderful sharing of your experiences. I note quite a lot from your presentation. 
And when you were speaking about what is happening in, in, in Kenya, it's like you're speaking what is taking place here in, in Uganda. Not only Nairobi is a gender sensitive city, our own Kampala here, it's a very gender sensitive, insensitive city. And when you, you, you speak to us about your, your challenges and your struggles in amplifying the rights of women, I really hear you. Can, going back to, to the story of, you, you said it's called Karibangi. The Karibangi, yes, yes Karibangi eviction. community and, and the eviction that took place. Even here in Uganda and very many countries within the East African region, there is, there is a lot of illegal eviction of our people. And who suffers in, in all this? Obviously it comes back to the, to the woman. And to just to bring it to your attention, for us here there is a lot of uh, uh, huge illegal land grabbing. And also to bring it to your attention here, that whereas in Kenya they were evicting a community that has marginalized women for the case of Uganda here we even evict the Uganda police and who is doing this government goes ahead to evict its own police yet you and I would expect that it should actually be government protecting its 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 policemen but coming back to the pertinent issues that come come out of uh, the Karibangi community eviction the woman the woman, we shall keep talking about the woman because it is the woman, it is the girl who is the marginalized person in, 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 in all this. Then you raise a very pertinent issue of, uh, pat of patriarchy. We shall keep talking about patriarchy because it does exist. It has eaten our sisters. We have very many of our women. We have very many young girls who have uh, died as a result of, uh, of patriarchy. And maybe to just highlight to you some of the recommendations that she highlights, Ruth says that we need to hold these corporations accountable. She also alludes that we need to, at a certain point, write to institutions like the African Development Bank. But when she was saying this, again, in my mind, I was like, what about the African Union? Where is it? Where is the sleeping giant called the African Union? Because we have seen very many women dying. We have seen so many women who have been evicted from their legal land which they are owning rightfully. She also highlighted about the constitution. We have these constitutions. We have so many laws that we have ratified, both at the rather very many instruments that we have ratified at the regional level and at the international level. Where are these uh, institutions? Where is the African Union when our women are dying? Where are they? But at the end of the day, we shall keep saying that, you know, Kenya is a member state of the African Union. Uganda is a member state of the African Union. But at the end of the day, all this is just on paperwork. It's just in documentation. But the implementation is a completely different thing, thing all, to, all together. But again, what I pick from, your, from Ruthie's presentation is uh, the power of networking as human rights defenders. When she says that they had to, to reach out to, to one of the human rights defenders who has a huge following on Twitter, I was like, yes, I think it is high time that we started taking social media as a very powerful tool in promoting the rights of uh, women. Without further ado, I will, uh, allow me welcome Salome to take us to, to the next speaker. Thank you, Ruth, for your presentation. Thank you so much. Salome. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, thank you, um, Asha, for summarizing what Ruth has shared with us and for bringing out uh, some of the recommendations that uh, emphasize on the need for us to work together as women from the region. Um, I now invite Jane Francis Oling, who heads a women-led grassroots organization called Women in Development which is based in the post-conflict Northern Uganda, a place called Oyam District. As a girl child raised and educated during the 21-year-old war in Northern Uganda, she started defending the rights of her community members, when, uh, especially women and girls, at the age of 15 years. She has a BA in social science from Makerere University and this is currently a woman human rights defender 
is helping women's voices to reach government through engaging parliament of the Republic of Uganda. She is the chairperson of the technical thematic working group of the National Coalition of Human Rights Defenders in Uganda. Jane Francis, Karibu. Thank you very much, Salome. And um, it is good meeting you, the colleagues, the fellow women human rights defenders. Um, Salome has said it all. She's um, introduced me widely. Yes, as um, a girl child, I was raised in the post-conflict northern Uganda, and it wasn't easy anymore. It wasn't easy. And uh, that gave me the opportunity to start defending the rights of women and girls just at the age of 15. And uh, at that time, I didn't know I was doing human rights defense. I didn't know I was doing activism, but there was need to uh, to a several of them without being abducted by the Lord's Resistance Army. And that kept me going and learning more about the human rights defense. Even at the time I joined the university, the girls at the university, and that gave me more chances to speak out, to, to, to approach government and say, look, we need additional points as girls. We need additional points because of ABCD, because we need more girls to join the university. And even while at the university, our girls needed a much more safer space for them to pursue their education. So I kept engaging government right from that time up to the time that I, I got done with school and started actively pursuing government to see how best our girls who were abducted by the laws resistance army could be brought back home and probably be rehabilitated and given another chance to go to school and um, this kept going and um, we reached a point when we came across the murder of the women what my two colleagues have already shared the women of wakiso and uh, in Tebe plus Nansana. So in that very year, 2017, I led a group of women from the civil society to parliament. To me, that was too much. In four months, having more women murdered and by unknown people whose intentions were not clear, to me, this was a crisis in the calendar, and we demanded that government comes up with a statement. What are they doing about the murders? What are they doing as government to end the murders? Who has been arrested and who has been reprimanded pursuing that? And up to now, we are still pursuing the police to give us the report, to give us um, the investigation report so we can know who was behind the murders of the women and what were the intentions. And then one other thing I would gladly want to share here is that uh, the women human rights defenders in Uganda have, have faced actually the same challenges as colleagues have been sharing because many of them have been unlawfully arrested and detained in the course of their work. And many of them have been denied the freedom of expression to speak about anything wrong that they're seeing. And also, we are still planning to have a dialogue with the Uganda police force to see that even during the arrest, there's that professionalism that makes the cells a safer space for women, that even during the arrest, there is no brutality, that women can still be safe in the custody and the police cannot continue to do to practice violence over the women who are being arrested for the particular you know sometimes there is uh, 
activism and you find the police arresting you. But all we are saying is that the police in Uganda have to really get into a good working relationship with the women. But I also want to thank uh, the National Coalition of Human Rights Defenders in Uganda. I really want to thank them on behalf of the women human rights defenders because the coalition has done all it can to make our work a safer space to make us do our work as we are supposed to do in times that we are threatened maybe unlawfully arrested and detained the coalition comes in i really want to thank the coalition the human the national coalition of the human rights defenders in uganda and uh, we are currently involved also in a conversation with the Electoral Commission to have the women political aspirants protected from violence, to have these women protected from intimidation. Because as the women of Uganda, we want more women in national leadership. We want more women in parliament. So we are fully represented and if these women are intimidated at the time that they are supposing as the women of this country so the conversation we are having with the electoral commission is that there should be that policy that protects these women from any form of violence from any form of intimidation and also um something that i want to thank the government of uganda for is that more women in Uganda are now at the national leadership uh, position. There are so many women compared to the past years. And these women have headed different sectors. And 50 50, you know, we are heading there. We are feeling represented in certain sectors where we never used to be. And um, I hope the government will continue to support more women and put them up there in the continue to speak for the girls who are in school. We can continue to be very good examples for them. And then back to the post-conflict Northern Uganda, we have the girls who have returned. Actually, there are now women who have returned from the LRA um, captivity. And these women continuously need psychosocial support. I hope that in future, if they are fully supported by government and they've gotten psychosocial support, we can continue to use them to create peace clubs, to communicate to the communities, to continue to sensitize our country that armed conflict is not good because women and children are at the forefront of any armed conflict. So as women in development, we continue to work with the former LRA abductees to create peace clubs in communities, to use them at the national dialogues, and we have continued to engage, continue to engage government that these women should be used at every peace talks, in fact at the front line because any armed conflict, women and children are key and they're the first victims. And we as women in development are pushing forward that this country can guard against any armed conflict. Um, as I summarize, we, we want to continue to communicate to government that the investigation results of the murdered women of Wakiso, Nansana and Entebbe be brought out so we can understand what happened because we are still very scared as these women were murdered and we cannot tell why. We cannot even know who murdered them. So that is one thing that I continue to speak about and I encourage other colleagues working here in Uganda with the civil society especially women's led organizations let's pursue this let us get to know from government where is the investigation report and who are these people who murdered the women and what is government doing about it who has been reprimanded anyway so these are a few things that as women we must not let go we must keep on pursuing and um, as the chairperson technical thematic working group 
of the National Coalition of the Human Rights Defenders in Uganda. I want to inform you colleagues that um, the women human rights defenders, as we speak now, have gotten a lot of security and digital training from the National Coalition of Human Rights Defenders. And as elections draw closer, we are going to be able to really manage a few challenges that come along with elections, given the training we've got from the National Coalition of Human Rights Defenders in Uganda. And I want to thank you, Salome and Asha, for coordinating this. And I hope that we can continue to work together for the betterment of our region. The region still needs a lot, a lot of our efforts. The region still needs a lot of our commitment. The region needs a lot of our minds to streamline on the gender issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jane Francis. You just add that the region needs women human rights defenders so that then we are able to check the violations from a gender perspective. Thank you so much for sharing. Just to summarize, I choose to pick on the challenges that you have raised, challenges that speak to the environment of women human rights defenders, challenges of being arrested, challenges of being curtailed to speak, challenges of how the police choose to arrest us. They do not apply gender sensitive approaches to arresting women defenders. Challenges of cells that we are taken into that are not conducive for women uh, activists and the challenges of the brutality that was meted on the women. What I loved most about your presentation is the fact that as women defenders and women activists in uh, Uganda, you are calling on the government to make the results available so that people can start understanding what actually happened. Of importance is the fact that you have been trained as women defenders. And what I'm throwing to you is the fact that when you are monitoring the elections, when you are monitoring the violations, always remember to put a gender lens into the monitoring. Because that is how we will identify who are the perpetrators, what is their motive, how is this impacting differently on men and women, boys and girls? And when we start speaking that language, that is when we are going to influence policy so that we do not just have policies, but we have policies that speak to the issues that women, boys, uh, men and women are facing and policies that seek to change our environment. I cannot emphasize more on patriarchy and I, I wish by the end of this session, we can all come up with a song that talks about patriarchy, a song that will make people start changing the way they view women and women human rights defenders. Allow me to invite Asha so that you can call in our next speaker. Thank you, Salome, and thank you, Jen Francis. Uh, allow me to invite Naila Abdallah, who is our next speaker. Uh, just a short bio about Naila. She is the founder and executive director of Sisters for Justice, a women-led organization which is working to promote and protect the rights, the rights of women and those of their children. Her professional experience in working on women's and youth empowerment, gender equity, policies, gender representation in culture, addressing gender-based violence and family reconciliation. She is a member of Pwani Social Justice Center Working Group. Please join me in welcoming Naila Abdallah. Naila, please make your submissions. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Assalamu alaikum, first of all, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I think it's almost the afternoon. Um, I would like to, first of all, I'm very humbled to be part and parcel of the East African uh, Women Human Rights Defenders, and uh, this really, really motivates me since um, I'm young in this field, and um, 
I think um, it really motivates me when I see Mastula Asha or what she has been advocating, when I see Madam Salome, the way she has been in the forefront in defending women. Uh, this really, and other women uh, defenders on this platform, it's really motivates me. And um, yes, I want to, to follow on the footsteps that you guys are doing, the good work that you've been doing in the and the defending field. Um, I want to give uh, give thanks to the organizers, the the people who have come up with this idea of bringing the women from East African region. I, I did see Tanzania, but I would have loved to see other Tanzanians human rights defenders and. Um, I think it's high time for all of us to come up together like this. As you say, there's a, um, a big African Union, it is big African charters that are defending uh, African, African issues, but we don't see them. We don't know where they, they are. And um, it's high time for us to come up together and see what uh, we can do about it. Okay, I'm speaking from Kenya, coastal region. I think um, most of us know Coast, um, Mombasa, and um, in Coast we've been having a very difficult situation, especially us Muslims, and um, okay, the majority of the population in Coast is Muslim, and um, we've been uh, challenged from different angles, and um, I came out strongly to to make people understand that Muslim or a Muslim woman, she has been recognized, she has been placed in line, she has been defended by the book of Allah. The book of Quran has her own set, her own sort of chapter just because of a woman. So there's no way a woman or social cultural barrier can, can lead a woman to, to be, I mean, uh, marginalized. If a whole book of God has stated about a woman, what about us? So in coast region, the different um, things that um, Muslims, young women have been marginalized in, in fact, it's double. Being a Muslim, being a woman eh, in the society, it's kind of a double marginalization. So um, as um, Sisters for Justice, we came out strongly in terms of trying to empower our women, empower our girls that are coming up that no, we need to take space. We need to take space as youth. We need to take space as Muslim girls. We need to take space as women in general. So we've been having different uh, issues, especially when it comes to counter violence, extremism. Um, Mombasa has a, has a history of uh, uh, counter, uh, countering violence, extremism, when it comes to ter <coughs> terrorist issues. And um, we've seen our girls crossing borders and uh, trying to join uh, the illegal groups. And uh, when you come to realize the issues or the, the roots of these things, it's very, uh, very pathetic, like I'm saying. Someone is crossing border in terms of going to defend maybe his family is being mistreated by the government, we're being marginalized, we're not being given the opportunity as youth, or we are not being um, given priority when it comes to any opportunity given in the, the country. As you know, Mombasa this time is having an issue with the government, especially when it comes to social economic uh, issues. Um, I'll speak about women, why they normally join or why the issues that are going on with them when it comes to extrajudicial killings. You find a uh, raid, there's raids in their houses. Sometimes a woman or the family is being in their own home, especially during these uh, recent issues in Ramadan that um, the family was in their house and they were having their iftar, but believe me, they didn't have to to take on with the iftar, the reason they were raided in, and the family was shot to death, and um, the mother was pregnant of eight months, I think, 
and the baby, the, the, the fighter saved the mother for the, for the life of, of the police that they shot the mother. They didn't see, uh, we were shocked and we were asking the police agency, if a pregnant woman can be seen and she's eight months, uh, eight months old, how comes you didn't see a woman, a pregnant woman screaming, eh? asking when she was telling us the, the situation, when she was telling us the situation, it was a very clear that uh, they didn't matter who she was, how she, a pregnant woman she is, and uh, they, they, kill, they wanted to kill her and they killed directly to the stomach. So it's a, it's a direct uh, message that uh, the security or the police sector, uh, I don't know if it's APTU was till today, we, we are asking who did that and why they did that. If they wanted the husband uh, who is uh, in court, they were suspecting to be a terrorist. But uh, if they wanted him, they would have come in the up or they would have get him to, to the house and get the husband and leave the family alone. But no, they killed the husband, they killed the two children of uh, four and three years old, yeah, and the fighter in the stomach, which is a very recent um, sad story that uh, the post people are facing. And um, till now, there's no any report that is. Uh, has been handed to us. Um, we've been also having issues uh, of COVID-19. We've, we've had several women uh, during the curfew, during the due time. You don't know your due date or your due time. You can be able to know your due date, but you don't know your due time. So most of the people coming out in the morning, they died the fear of they rather stay in the house than going outside because of the police curfew. So this is a stories and uh, we have testimonies. We have people who have been uh, affected with the COVID-19 and um, I think with the coalition, Defenders Coalition, we've been able to uh, get gather the cases. Maybe we will we will handle this case to the court and uh, set justice uh, for our women who have been affected. Together at the same time, when I'm talking about women, I'm also talking about youth. Since I'm also in this sector of youth and leading, you know, youth have been left out in Kenya. And um, we know the 75% of population in Kenya are youth. And uh, mind you, no youth, uh, is being involved or the, if there is, it's just formality, as you normally say, formality, but um, nothing more, nothing less. And um, living in the slums or living in an um, area that um, are highly affected with poverty, most of them are, are, are taken as criminals or criminalization to them and uh, they ended up uh, trying to form illegal groups, uh, famously known as Wakali Kwanza, Wabibi. Those are youth group. They majorly or they focus in uh, trying in terms of when you hear them, it's a revenge or they're saying we are being left out and, uh, and we, are, we are trying to bring the youth uh, since, um, well, when, uh, when we try to talk to youth, or when I try to talk to youth, when you hear out their grievances, and um, most of their grievances is the opportunity, lack of cooperation, economic, and uh, everything in cost, they've been marginalized, everything in cost, they've been left out due to maybe some, they say it's because of our religion's uh, aspects or because we are coming from a marginalized community in Kenya, or they have different perspective or perspective on how this thing is being done. But uh, Sisters for Justice trying to work hard together with the leading uh, organization, Happy Africa, we've been coming out strongly to assist our youth, to assist our women. No, this you need to do this because Chichikon is there. You have all the right, whether you are, this or your this or your marginalized or your by the virtue of you being a human being you have your own rights um 
again, I want also to say about psychosocial uh, torture that uh, most most women are the caused in one way or the other, they will be affected psychologically, economically, and socially. Why? Why do I say this? When it comes to extrajudicial killings, when it comes to disappearances, when it comes to um, issue of violence extremists, for example, when you see your husband or when you, have, when you have issues with the government in terms of terrorism, in terms of violence extremism, the family of the mother or the family become, I don't know, they isolate you or you become like a burden in the society, stigma, ah, this is the wife to that Ashabab man, this is the wife to that boy who kills everyone. So women are the society or in our society, especially in Mombasa, we've been affected psychologically. Some have even gone, I don't mental mental disorder, health. That um, I, we once had a demonstration on Wakwapi disappearance day. The woman was the, the woman, the mother of one boy who disappeared almost three years now. She became, uh, we, we started seeing her doing crazy stuff on the road, or she started crying, she started throwing her old clothes, she started throwing everything. We tried to calm her on she. She was affected uh, psychologically. So that's also one of the major problems that us we are facing. And uh, Sisters for Justice, we usually try to look upon on the counselors, you know, the psychologists. And um, uh, kind of, they are kind of expensive when you hire them or when you consult them. And uh, this is what we are trying to localize on resources on how can we get our own community psychologists, our own people being trained to be psychologists, psychologists, or psychologists to assist our women. And um, apart from that, they like say social cultural about women in this professional, especially uh, when you're being uh, seen to be a feminity. And at the same time, you're a Muslim girl outside there trying to say this, trying to uh, Use people trying to see where, the, where human rights has been violated. Uh, you're being told that, uh, that those um, uh, westernized whatever according to how we normally be Oh, I don't know. I think I'm, I'm all already. I'm okay. Hello? Okay. Okay. I, I, are you done, Naila? Okay. So let me try to give my full recommendation on, um, on the situation that are facing us in the coast region that um, we need to, to show, we need to follow up and uh, resources, uh, resources to follow up on these issues. It's quite um, difficult and um, as we know that uh, following up on cases of extrajudicial killings, disappearance, terrorism, violence, extremism, it's not an easy and easy task. It's all a matter of your security. It's a, it's a matter of security. And uh, I usually uh, go, I usually knock the door of coalition defenders. I want to try this case, but this case is you, it's above me. How am I going about it? How is my security? How is this and that? And um, as we want to be there for others, we also need to assure ourselves that, yes, we are doing this. I know we are doing this for, you, for our community, for our people, but what about our security? As um, normally asked to other human rights defenders, and uh, I was told this is a call. This is a, this is a call. You cannot... Uh, try to see where you, you want to, anything that comes across you, you need to deal with it. So um, uh, apart from that, also another measure are the grassroots, since our center is at the grassroots, and um, the major problem is also gender-based violence. I don't know when gender-based violence end, but um, we need to come out strongly with, the, with our community and uh, uh, sisters for justice, we want to involve men. 
because we've been talking about gender-based violence. Gender-based violence. What is gender-based violence? Well, who are the perpetrators? Let's sit down with the perpetrators. Let's sit down with these rapists. Let's sit down with the husbands who are mistreating their wife. Let them understand. We've been having different meetings, conferences on women alone. I wish this meeting or this platform would have involved women. That they're the same people that we will sit down with them at our homes, at our community, at our brothers. We need to tell them, we need to tell, we need to raise a young boy that, um, you know, sitting down, being completely trying to educate our men. Maybe they don't understand, maybe they don't have this uh, essence or they don't know. Like, for example, at home, we raise our boys that you cannot take a plate, let your sister take that plate to the kitchen. See, we are already setting uh, different um, ideologies to boys that a man cannot do this. Or a, a woman is the only one who is supposed to do this. So we are coming up with different programs that we want to involve men in discussion and disappropriation, the impact of conflicts on women, peace building. We have different barrazas, different meeting contributions. Our meeting usually makes to men. So that we can be able to drive the ideology on how a woman is precious in our society. Um, with that few remarks, I think I've been able to capture most of the things I wanted to say. And um, I'm here and um, I'm ready to learn and I'm ready to hear the recommendation that should come out of this program. And um, we are together in this. A line of defending women, human rights. Thank you, Mastula. Thank you, Naila. Thank you so much for your very informative uh, uh, discussion. Uh, it's like you're speaking to me myself. I am a Muslim girl. And one of these days, I have been forced to think that being a Muslim girl or being a Muslim woman is actually crimin criminal. In its, its, in its own self or in its own being. Because uh, many times I have come out to speak about the rights of Muslim women or about the rights of other women. And for some reason, society thinks that a Muslim girl or a Muslim woman cannot speak out. Just the other day I had an interview here. They were coming up with the, with the, with the gender policy of an organization and I was called in as one of the interviewees. And after the interview, this woman was candid enough to tell me that you are the first eloquent Muslim woman I have spoken to. Then I was like, why? And she's like, Muslim women are not supposed to speak out. But hey, you, there is a whole lot of ignorance out there about who a Muslim woman is. The Quran itself, just like Naila has, uh, has noted that it gives a Muslim woman so many rights, including the right to education, the right to even abortion, as long as the life of the baby and the life of the mother are at risk. But who comes out to speak about these rights? So when Inaila tells us here that when she talks about some of the things back in Mombasa, she's at the end of the day incriminated, I actually hear you out. She raises the issue of violent extremism and the psychological torture that comes to, to women. Absolutely, even here back home here in Uganda, there is, a, there is violent extremism, but at the end of the day still, women are implicated more, they are affected more. We've had a, a case here in Uganda where we have had Muslim sheikhs who have been uh, in jail for over two years, and who suffers at the end of the day? It is the woman. Why? Because of patriarchy. Patriarchy dictates that as a woman, I'm supposed to depend on my husband for each and and everything. So I absolutely hear you. And in her recommendations, she highlights that uh, uh, we need to come up with new programs, just like they are coming up, coming up with programs to support uh, women, but also to bring on board boys and men, so that at the end of the day, the narrative can can change. Of course, because of patriarchy, we all know that you know many of our communities will not allow a man or a boy to do certain work. Just like Naila is highlighting, it's not only in Mombasa or not only in Kenya, within the East African region or within the entire Africa and many of our communities. Patriarchy is root, deeply rooted within our 
communities whereby they think that you know because you've spoken this they're going to stereotype you so at the end of the day i think just like naila has highlighted we need to unlearn and change the narrative at this point allow me called salome to bring on board our next speaker thank you naila thank you naila for reminding us that uh, we were once young and uh, for taking up the button so that you are now running with the issues of being girls, being young, and being from a Muslim community, and you're doing quite well. Allow me to invite our next speaker, Nabizi Yulalie, who is a Burundian national. Uh, she is the executive director of Burundian Coalition of Human Rights Defenders which is currently being run uh, in Uganda. And uh, for Nabizi, she has been in exile since 2015 and she is doing quite well. Her work entails uh, working towards defense and promotion of human rights for her community and women and other human rights defenders. She is involved in many activities on human rights matters, among them policy analysis, mediation and negotiation, advocacy, peace building, and uh, especially peace building uh, during post-conflict reforms. She has also participated in consultative workshops on behalf of civil society in exile, organized by the Inter-Burundian Dialogue Facilitation. This was in 2017 and 2018. May you put your hands together for Yulalie. I'm sorry, Salome, just, just before you begin, Yulalie, I apologize for interrupting. I want to just recognize that we are already way over time with the session. So I just Correct. want to um, ask everybody um, for your patience. Um, I really hope you'll be able to stay on for a little bit longer. This has been such a rich panel. Um, so if you don't mind uh, sticking with us, um, all of the participants, I, um, this would be great. Um, Salome, Asha, I just want to check in with you. Is, is this your last speaker? Yes, yes, this is the last speaker. Okay. So thank you so much, everybody. We're gonna continue because this is so rich and it's so important to hear from these human rights defenders. We have about 15 minutes left and then I have to start ready, readying for the next session. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for organizing this uh, session and I will apologize before about uh, my language, my English, but I will try the best. Uh, as uh, you heard uh, about it, Sarome presented me as a human rights defender in exile. I'm working in exile and uh, my presentation will be marked off that, uh, uh, by that situation. As an introduction to my presentation, uh, it's just to remind for those who don't know that uh, Burundians are convinced that the adoption of the resolution 1325 is inspired by the Burundian struggle women Burundian struggle to participate alongside men in Arusha negotiation for the resolution of Burundian conflict from 1993 to 2000. Once adopted, the resolution was implemented with enthusiasm from women, from government, and also from, uh, by the the collaboration of our partners. Starting with the National Platform of Women and Civil Society Organization, the government throughout all the structures of the administration and the partners throughout the United Nation system and the bilateral cooperation. And now I can safely say that 
the implementation of the 30 25 resolution in Burundi is closely linked to the respect of the implementation of Arusha Accord for Peace and Reconciliation. That said, my presentation will distinguish two main periods. The first one runs from 2005 to 2015, corresponding to the implementation of the resolution within the framework of peace building programs, the implementation of the Arusha Agreement in the second period ran from 2015 till today with the violation of the Arusha Agreement, the destruction of all the achievement. As you know, the implementation of this resolution requires the political will and translation of the will into acts of commitment, the respect of the commitment, and the preservation of the achievement. Note that for the first period, 2005 to 2014, Burundi was in post-conflict period, and civil society organization as well as women's organization were actively involved in peace building programs from the national level to the community level. Frameworks such as women networks, mixed women network, were, were set up under the initiative of the local administration and the NGOs under the supervision of the Ministry of Home Affairs and the Communal Development, which became, with the new government, the Minister from Interior and Public Security and Community Development. The network of women actors of peace and dialogue network of women mediator is a structure which supports conflict resolution alongside. Women from NGOs have organized themselves with the guidance of the local administration to set up groups of women leaders at the community level and at the intermediate level in the commune and provinces. A series of training awareness, advocacy, setting up of community development group activities. They benefit from the national policy and invo in, uh, of involving women in the economic, political, and social development of the country. The voice of women and their presence was appreciated across all sectors of life in Burundi, even though most were not informed of why that they were implementing the UN Security Council Resolution 1925. Since 2015, Burundian leaders have violated Arusha Peace and Reconciliation Agreement. Women and men have protested and the government has responded with violence and the massive human rights violation. Collaboration with the United Nations system deteriorated and Burundi is still under international sanctions. As a consequence, that affected the implementation of the resolution. There is destruction of women's and civil society platform at national level, independent media, the most active women leaders have been forced into exile, and those who have remained who have remained in the country are silent for their sur survivor. Community leaders and their grassroots structures have persisted and are still struggling to maintain the gain of peace building period. The unwillingness of partners to support Burundi has slowed down or even stopped the implementation of support program for the resolution 1325. All sectors are of life have been politicized and put under the control of ruling party. Civil society organization and intermediary, the national structures for the implementation of the resolution have been weakened the political speech has shifted away principles of resolution 1825 as the achievement of Arusha Accord collapsed 
before our eyes. Now, I present to you the role of community leaders. Women community leaders within the level of the pillar one, conflict prevention. The basic, the basic network of, of women leaders animate the community dialogue between the members of the community, including the representative of administration dialogue, especially when they see the emergence of tension. They raise awareness of the social problems that cause conflict or in the marriage right of women, the family and the community, which are, for example, polygamy, drunkenness, drunkenness problems of school dropout, unwanted pregnancy, violation of human rights in general, security, poverty, and so on. They monitor violation, discuss them with the local administration, make alert communal on the communal structures and administration in the event of violation, and they report the perpetrators, perpetrators to justice. They use listening, healing, and guiding victim to, com to, com to competent structures. They make mediation in case of conflict. They act as a link between the, communi the communities and the administration or the conflict or other conflict resolution institutions at the community level. They make women and the community members be aware of peace, the fight against violence, the participation of women. At the second pillar, participation, women participate in the realization of peace consolidation programs either as actors or as participants in organized events are elected at the level of decision-making making bodies, they participate in political activities, they sensitize women, elect, rally, or to, to campaign for political position and elect women. At the third pillar, economic level, uh, economic recovery, the women's community network are always entry point for development stakeholders to reach communities. The creation of groups where they, where they carry out development activities with the support of partners in a matter of saving and loans for the empowerment of women and actively participate in the implementation of production development activities and cooperatives. The, the intermediate level municipal mediators relay the report to the upper level provinces and the ministry of home affairs. What is the visibility of women leader? Very, they are very visible in the field of conflict resolution in a small in the in small businesses. They are very visible in the chain of solidarity set up for development like breeding. They are less visible in the political field because they are rejected by political actors. They are less visible at the level of national advocacy with decision-making bodies. They are less visible at the level of sub-regional, regional and international advocacy. Women remain underrepresented at the, at the, the basic level and the provincial level in politics they are, their, the rate of visibility is too low in decision-making position. In technical sectors, and the, the rate is less than 30% in education, health, public administration services, and in the business network. What are success stories? We have strong structures in 18 provinces and there is rapid circulation of information between mediators across the country. In some provinces, men are forced to migrate far away from their province to marry a second woman 
in, in the situation of polygamy. They are in the process of training junior mediators to accelerate awareness against unwanted pregnancy, but also to ensure the, su the succession. In some provinces, they influenced the administration decision to release young people arbitrarily detained and to prohibit the participation of ruling party youth in maintaining security. They are consulted by the local administration. The network of mediators recovered competent women from a banned organization or criticized or civil society organization and made it possible to capitalize the experience required in their original organization. But, and women are feared when they enter in politics. What is the challenge? We have many challenges. Is insecurity and the political violence threat, that threaten women and prevent them from getting involved in or limit their ambition. Current political speech shows a big gap. With the text and the achievement, which reduce participation and efficiency for rural women. Women community leaders have a weak technical capacity to read and interpret basic text for their action and their protection. Is a lack of financial means in carrying out, out the, their work for communication, the transport, and the assistance to victims. Also, critical rally. The propaganda require means to the women that women do not have. There's heavy domestic burdens. Rural women have a thousand arms and lack time to fully participate in politics. Reduction of civic space and the breakup of national platforms since 2015 weakened the action. The politization, the politization politicization of civil society and all sectors of life, the fear of discussing a certain subject when it is the patient of the administration of or ruling the party who are guilty. Threats from perpetrators of human rights violations such as sexual gender-based violence, marginalized by at the time of political leaders who are victims or of threats following their work, weakness of justice. Yulali should be winding up. Hello? It seems we lost her. Yes. Yeah, she uh, just cut off. Yeah. Seems, or, all right. Uh, I take this opportunity to say thank you to Nabizi. Uh, just to uh, summarize a bit, she has brought us through the journey, the journey of uh, the peace process the Arusha declaration and the falling of the same. She has explained the work that civil society has tried to do and mentioned that uh, they continue to be weakened. However, they are doing a lot. Uh, she has raised issues of how women are visible in particular fields, especially in conflict resolution, in showing solidarity, but they are less visible when it comes to politics and decision making. And this is not unique uh, to Burundi alone. I think it is unique to the region. And this calls for us to be able to rise up as women and sit in the tables of decision making. I liked what Miriam posted, that if we are not in the tables of decision making, we will be in the menu. So can we strive not to be in the menu, 
but to be on the table of decision making. I want to request all of us kindly to switch on our video. It is our hour of celebrating ourselves. Switch on your video and then we are going to do a group photo. So participants, panelists, uh, let's continue to switch on our video uh, so that Aileen can do us the honors of taking a photo. Naila, switch on. Arizarua, switch on your video. Carol, Juliet Were, just switch on. Diana, my colleague, switch on. Uh, Esban, my colleague, switch on. Dolphin, happy to see you. I hope Kisumu, you are doing well. Switch on, please. Let's turn on. Is the one who is taking a photo. You want us to take a photo of your name? Naila, please. Especially for the panelists. Some people may not want to show their photo. That's okay too. Or, no, I, I, but, but, I believe you, you. but we would love to see your faces, your smiling faces. I see, <laughs> I see many familiar people. Haha, <laughs> Dolphine. Every day is a bad hair day for me, so I don't know what you're worrying about. <laughs> um, thank you, everybody. I'll just take a quick photo and then we will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mastula, uh, wind, wind up and close for us the session. Uh, thank you so much, our dear participants. Uh, sorry about that. I had just muted myself. Thank you so, so, so much for taking time off your busy schedule to come and be part of this wonderful session. For me, as I listened in to all participants, rather all panelists from the different countries within the East African region, like there are key issues that came, came up and all kept re repeating from the different panelists. And one recommendation that I can take home is that as feminists, as women rights defenders within the region, I think it's high time we got up and, you know, networked or collaborated more because you realize that the things that all the issues that we are trying to raise here keep cross-cutting from one country to to another otherwise thank you so much thank you aileen and the entire Cody team for bringing this together honestly it's been a good time trying to remember and commemorate the 20 years of the un security council resolution 1325 Thank you from me to you, Salome, if you have anything to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aileen, and thank you all the participants. I hope to see a regional initiative out of this for women human rights defenders to push for our agenda. We have so many issues from Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia, Burundi, Rwanda, Tanzania, Southern Sudan, and even if they were not part of this meeting, you can be assured as women, we are good networkers and we are going to do it. Thank you so much. Hope to see you physically after the pandemic. Bye just for now. A quick one, you can go on the discussion forum because we've not had the opportunity to ask questions. Just go on the discussion forum on the Kodia website and then you can post your questions and all your comments there. Otherwise, thank you and bye bye. Bye bye. bye. bye.